two years in the field. <coughs> Just a brief introduction. Um, my name is Kusai Saraf. I'm based in the UK. Um, I do travel to Asia quite um, uh, frequently, so I spend almost half my time between Europe and, and Asia. Um, I head um, a company called Ivis Group, which um, is a specialist in, uh, in multi-channel, omni-channel retailing, uh, with presence in uh, London, Beijing, and uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, uh, soon to open an office in, uh, in Shanghai. Um, I was one of seven people at uh, the start of Tesco.com back in 1996. Tesco is the second largest retailer in the world after Walmart. And in 1996, they started um, a new venture called Tesco.com, which was the beginning of providing um, online and e-commerce venture. In terms of why this course, so the first time I pitched this course to, um, to Peking University about um, two and a half years ago, three years ago, um, the, uh, the, the dean made a comment. He said, um, we don't have many retailers coming to, uh, uh, to the university. We have people from various sectors, but not so much retailers. And, and I explained at the time that with the market trends, with the way the market is, is going, and China moving more towards uh, a consumer consumption um, kind of economy, uh, this is going to be more and more important. And once uh, um, you know, I, uh, I shared uh, you know, where, where this could potentially go in terms of the market trends, then they were quite happy you know, to, uh, to have this as a course. So there are lots of changes happening right now in the, in the Chinese market. And the government is right behind all of these changes. And as um, the economy is switching from, um, from export uh, more into, um, uh, in, into consumer consumption, you will see a lot of changes. And already, uh, in the time I've spent in China, I've seen huge amount of changes in the way people transact, in the way people uh, you know, uh, uh, engage with, uh, with brands, with retailers. Uh, things happening very, very fast. And uh, even though four or five years ago, China was uh, so behind uh, in terms of multi-channel and omni-channel compared to uh, Western countries, in some aspects, not only they caught up, but also they exceeded. Um, they, uh, uh, so there is a very fast pace happening right now, especially in areas such as social uh, media and, and mobile. So very exciting time ahead. So the key word here is change. Change is happening very fast, very rapidly. And for you to understand the drivers of the change and how do you go about the transformation, uh, hopefully that would uh, help you to, uh, uh, you know, to do uh, better and then to progress your career in, in a more powerful way. So these changes are creating challenges and opportunities at the same time. You know challenges and opportunities are two sides of the same coin. <coughs> you can look at anything as this is a big problem, this is a challenge, but at the same time you can look at it as positively and basically figure out that you know, if we're suffering, then others are suffering as well. So if we can crack a solution here, uh, then we, we could be market leaders. And right now, uh, the market is as such that uh, there, are, there is a lot of room uh, for taking that kind of leadership across all sectors. Um, so when we engage with uh, prospects in China, you know, um, many organizations, uh, brands, etc., are aware they need to change, but they just don't know how to change. Sometimes the change is driven by technology, and, uh, and, and, and one, one good thing about this is uh, people are uh, ready to, uh, to in involve innovation and technology to solve problems. That's a good thing. The bad thing is technology on its own doesn't do anything. Technology without process, technology without organization change, on its own is a liability because you know you are inheriting something a large system that you try to somehow show within your, within your organization and if you don't take measures to understand how to bed it in and, and what will be the impact on the organization then that technology could work against you not for you and there are many uh, you know spectacular uh, stories in China about various retailers and, and brands bought big technology and then it worked completely the opposite. So we'll talk more about that. Uh, so we'll talk about um, the commercialization um, of the internet 
and how, uh, you know, the phrase multi-channel brings so many things together. It talks about, it brings in marketing, it brings branding, it brings um, um, human uh, capital, human resource, uh, leadership. Um, you know, there are so many things that are all brought under the multi-channel. This course is uh, classified as a marketing course, and obviously there is a lot of marketing input, uh, but uh, it, it will have a lot of implications in many other areas. And I'll try uh, within the course of uh, the two days to share with you my experience based on all of these fields. Um, Peter Drucker basically described business as two things, marketing and innovation. So this course begins with a general introduction and then we're going to focus on these two things. We're going to dedicate the next part to talk about marketing. And obviously you have already um, attended, I'm sure, a number of sessions to talk about marketing. So you have a pretty good picture about marketing and 4Ps, etc. I'm going to talk about it maybe in a slightly different style, maybe less academic and more practical. So there is a lot of marketing in terms of what we're going to talk about. And then uh, part three, we're going to talk about innovation. So marketing and innovation are, if you like, the two pillars upon which this course uh, stands. The first part is just the introduction. And the last part is the conclusion. How do you actually use all the material we talked about to bring together transformation? So, so usually, um, you know, when I, when I teach, I like to give a big picture, then go through the details, and then summarize at the end. So that's what we're doing in this course. So, Part one is the customer-centric organization. What does it mean to, to be customer-centric? What does customer-centricity mean to you in your own respective field? Why should you care and how you should go about it? And there's a lot of misconception about customer-centricity. So hopefully by the end of this part, you'll have a pretty good picture. Um, so we'll, we'll do part one this morning. And then uh, we'll have a, a start at uh, part two after lunch. We'll talk about uh, multi-channel marketing. Um, part three, we'll start tomorrow morning innovation. And then part four uh, will be the last part after lunch. So each half day will be dedicated to one of these parts. <coughs> OK, so let's begin customer-centric organization. And let's begin to talk about the trends. So I've been retail for um, 22 years. Um, and uh, during these years, retail completely turned upside down. Huge changes. But if, if I were to step back and summarize the key change, what actually happened, you know, in, in, in a nutshell, in a statement, it would be the picture on the left. Um, 20 years or 10 years ago or even 5 years ago, retailers used to dominate. Retailers decide the market rules and consumers have to adapt to whatever retailers do, whatever retailers say. Today, if you fast forward to today, uh, customers decide the market rules. They are absolutely in charge. They are absolutely in control of what's happening. And retailers are trying to catch up. They are trying to keep pace uh, with customers. So. First question of the day, um, anyone want to um, give any comment to this? So anyone from your own experience has seen how this actually is happening. Can anyone give me an example of how consumers are deciding market rules today? Too early to ask questions? Anything that you've seen in the market to confirm or to validate the statement that is consumers that are in charge today, not retailers? Okay, most of you are too young maybe to remember how things used to be. In the past, retailers decide everything. They decide what to sell, how much they sell it, how they sell it, what channels they use, they pretty much decide everything. And you just have to follow as a consumer. You just have to buy whatever they give you. But that's not true today. Today, I'll just give an example. Um, if you walk into a Tesco store in the UK and you do your shopping, um, 
when you pay at the till, on your receipt, you'll have one of two messages. Either it will say to you, based on what um, you bought, we have saved you that much money based on our competitors, or we couldn't save you money in this, um, in this case, but here is a voucher for the difference. This means from a transparency perspective in terms of pricing and in terms of um, customer centricity, that's a very powerful example to demonstrate how, um, how things have changed. It's no longer about I'm going to hide my pricing and I'm going to give you very little information and you're going to be forced to buy from me. Now, even before you ask for a discount, I am giving you a discount. That's how much things have changed. Um, one of the VPs of um, Coca-Cola described their trading as saying, a good day for us is a day where we can engage in part of the dialogue happening with the, our customers. That's a very powerful statement, you know, coming from a brand like Coca-Cola. They're saying a good day is one that we can engage, not initiate, but engage. 20 years ago, Coca-Cola would, would initiate, would drive, would control the dialogue, would control the communication. The relationship was um, an upper position. The retailers and the brands almost, you know, talk down to the consumers. Uh, you know, they talk about how great they are and, and you just basically have to follow. Today, they are on the same level. So they have to engage with customers. So they, these are the changes. Consumers are in control. Now, that is true for retail. Is it true for other, other sectors? Is it true for finance? Is it true for uh, media? Is it true for logistics? Is it true for um, telco, travel, airlines? Absolutely true in all of these sectors. Uh, because in, in all of these sectors, you, you do care about your customers. You have to care about the customers. Otherwise, they will vote with their feet and, and they will go elsewhere. So, you know, ability to understand how to maximize your offering, how much you personalize your offering, how much you take the customer um, service into, in, into account and give them the best service you can. If you don't do this, then you're extinct. So this is what's happening in the, in the market today. And when I see examples of C-Trip in China, C-Trip is a great example of uh, a customer-centric application. You know, they, they really um, go um, uh, you know, and, and they, they try their best. To, to try to bring in a good service for, for the consumer. So it's happening in China. Maybe not a um, huge number of examples, but definitely the trend is happening. The second big thing happening is this. Uh, retail is no longer about transactions. So retail is not just about customers coming in, they buy, and then they walk out. That isn't retail anymore. Retail now is a dialogue is a continuous dialogue that begins before the transaction is made. Uh, because if you look at how we shop today, even before we buy, we go out and we check who we're buying from. We use social media. We, we uh, read reviews. We talk to our peers. We try to understand more about the service and the brand and the retails before we even engage with them. So, you know, that's, the, that's, if you like, the research part. Once we convince, then we buy, then we transact. But once we transact, it doesn't end there because we then go on from transaction into the third part, which is to share. Share our experience with the brand, with the um, offering, with the service. So it's a continuous dialogue. So here I would like to um, uh, dispel a few myths about e-commerce and about multi-channel. If a, if a retailer or a brand thinks of internet as cannibalizing their sales, they don't get it. If someone says, um, you know, the internet, uh, e-commerce doesn't have a place because people are not using um, online, you know, um, they, they, they like to come to the stores. This is a, is a very outdated view because this view is assuming the internet is only used for buying, and, and it's not. Digital is not only about buying, it's also about research, it's about sharing. And that's key in terms of understanding um, you know, how to um, 
communicate how to deal with customers. So, second question. If you are engaged in a dialogue, so if retail is a dialogue and it's not just transaction, what's important for you? What are the key things important for you as a brand when you engage in this dialogue? Any suggestions? After lunch, I expect people to be quiet because, you know, it's after lunch. But it's morning, so... Any offerings? Brand image. Brand image. Yep. Very good point. Thank you. Brand image. And to be specific, the brand image consistency. Because... If I'm engaging with a, with a brand or retailer and the brand appears as one picture in one way and then appears as a completely different picture in another way, then I don't know who this brand is. And what I mean by that is it could be about how you position yourself in terms of market positioning, whether you are high, medium or low, uh, whether you are serious or fun, you know, in terms of how you interact, how you engage, and, and many other things. So we live in a world that in one way is getting too complex because you have too many channels that the consumers are, uh, are using to talk to you. And you need to have, as the, as, uh, uh, as the gentleman said, you need to have that brand image consistency. Otherwise, consumers wouldn't, be, uh, you know, wouldn't know who you are. And if they don't know who you are, then there is a lack of trust. And if there is a lack of trust, then they wouldn't be in, in that kind of continuous dialogue. So brand image and the brand consistency is key um, you know, to make this thing work. So these are the two, if you like, most important um, trends um, that are happening in terms of um, the uh, customers are in control and uh, the second one is the continuous dialogue. Other uh, trends happening is um, there is almost like a, a musical chair being played between brands and retailers. You know, they are swapping places. Brands are trying to become retailers and reinvent themselves as retailers because they want to get closer to the customer. They don't want a middle, middle man. They want to be able to deal with the customers directly. They want to understand more about the customers in terms of why they buy, why they don't buy, what are the preferences and so on. Equally, retailers are also trying to reinvent themselves to become, if you like, brands and differentiated. If you look at um, um, the Chinese department stores, walk into any department store and you know, just look around you in terms of what's being offered and you will realize actually all of these department stores are selling the same thing. There is no difference as such between one department store and, and, and another. And the reason for that is these department stores generally in China operate on a 100% concession. Concession model, concession business model means you don't own the stock. So a department store um, would effectively rent out the space for brands to bring in their merchandise and sell. So this means, actually this means they're not retailers. They are more like landlords rather than retailers. As a result, all of them look the same. And when, you, when they try to go online and multi-channel, they can't, they have a problem because they lack any kind of differentiation. So a lot of them now started to think about things like private label, to have their own private label. They started to think about brand differentiation. Um, to distinguish themselves, otherwise there is no difference and consumers wouldn't be, wouldn't be shopping from them. So this is, this is happening in terms of brands and retailers. The other thing happening is, as I mentioned, you have this convergence on retail from, from all sectors. A good telco is a retailer. A good media is a retailer. A good airline is a retailer and so on and so forth. The, you know, they are all if you like, uh, moving into understanding how retail business as a sector maximize uh, their offerings by engaging with consumers. 
Um, I've been banking with the same bank for 30 um, odd years, 30, 35 years. So, you know, you would think they know everything about me and, uh, you know, and, but actually I receive very little in terms of um, personalized service as such, even though they have all that data about me. Uh, so there is a very big gap in terms of what's happening today and what could happen, what should happen in terms of understanding your customers better, segment them, profile them, and then personalize your offerings to them. So, but this is all happening now, and that's what I mean by the changes that, um, uh, you know, that we need to take into account. One question always get asked is about the future of stores. Is everyone going to go digital? Are stores going to die? Um, are we going to completely change the way we shop and uh, there is no more space for stores? Um, part of this statement is true, which is, of course, you know, the way we, we shop is changed completely and, and it will continue to change. But stores are not going to disappear. There will always be space for them. What's going to happen is stores would change in terms of how they operate. If you walk into um, a Burberry um, you know, shop in the UK, there is no cash till, there is no post, there is no point of sale, you know, there's no big cash machine that you go. Instead, you will have a number of people, uh, you know, dressed very smartly, carrying uh, an iPad, and that's acting as uh, what's known as AOP, assisted order point, or EPOS, electronic point, uh, um, uh, electronic point of sale. So it's a portable device, they come to you, they engage with you in terms of the transactions. The, our, you know, the space is, um, most of the space in shops like uh, Burberry, and we'll talk more about that later, uh, are seating places, you know, areas, you know, where you have uh, comfortable sofas, where you, you have a drink, you engage, you look at the paintings, you look at the artwork. Um, in some of these shops, it's, it's becoming more like a museum, more like an art gallery. Uh, so hence, you start to see uh, the store itself is changing rather than acting as a place whereby they take your money to a place whereby you, uh, you have an experience. So you see lots of malls, um, you know, they're opening spas and restaurants and um, facials and, and, and all sorts of uh, things in terms of having that kind of experience and, and lifestyle. Social is obviously very strong. Ours, I talked about some stores, you know, more, look more like galleries. And sometimes there is an element of surprise. Uh, you know, you walk in the store and suddenly you see something that you didn't expect to see in a store, you know, like a motorcycle just hidden in a corner, you know, or, or, a, or a, an antique chandelier and, and so on. And these things change on a regular basis to keep it interesting, to keep it exciting. So understanding about customers, understanding about change is, uh, is critical in, uh, in this period to understand how things are, are moving and, and, and what's likely to happen. So <coughs> I touched on this um, a little bit. As, um, as, you know, lots of people talk about, you know, the slowdown in China. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe the GDP is slowing down in China, but you know, still, it's, it's, very, it's incredibly healthy, 7% uh, and higher. <clears throat> you know, I'm sure many European countries would be um, very pleased with half that. Uh, so yes, things are slowing down, but still lots of um, uh, upside and, and, and huge opportunities. But what, ten, what seems to be happening is um, all the achievement that uh, you know, had been gained in the last 10 years have been mostly based on government stimulus. Uh, you know, the government is actually engaging in massive uh, projects and this is creating um, you know, a massive wave in terms of uh, pushing the economy and, um, and obviously um, export as well. But now, as the Chinese market is moving more, to, moving more towards consumption, um, you know, um, retail uh, makes you know, almost 25% of, of GDP. The, um, the multi-channel aspect of that retail is still at um, a fraction of what it should be. So there are huge changes in terms of um, the implications in terms of moving towards consumption-based economy and how retailers and, um, and government are actually reacting. Mm -hmm. um, so the government recognized this and uh, last year they announced an initiative called Internet Plus. 
and the government is actually uh, encouraging brands and retailers to, uh, to go to IPO uh, to get the financial support uh, to use uh, uh, foreign expertise where they need to in order to be more competitive, in order to compete with the foreign brands, with the foreign retailers uh, you know, coming to China. So lots of uh, change in, changes happening in terms of uh, uh, you know, the, the trends. Also, when you look at the segments, um, and uh, you can see the chart we have here is comparing uh, the picture from 2012 and then 10 years ahead based on upper class, upper middle class in terms of, con I'm talking about consumption, I'm not talking about uh, you know, uh, other types of classes here, lower, middle and, and lower. And you can see that uh, there is an increase, say from 3% to 9% in terms of the upper um, uh, aspect. Uh, and there is a reduction in terms of the lower from 29 to 16. Uh, but the, the big change is happening here in terms of the upper middle. That's where huge um, expansion is happening. And this is being reflected uh, in terms of these points here. The um, changes in demographics, the um, raise um, in terms of income, in terms of education, uh, in terms of uh, uh, urbanization, um, you know, aspiration, attitude, there are a lot of changes happening in, in the Chinese market, and uh, whereby price sensitivity, um, and which, what, which was driving many consumers to the internet, if you look at Tmall and, you know, uh, in, in terms of who would actually shop at Tmall and, and the reason why it dominated the market for a long time, that kind of price sensitivity is no longer going to be the only uh, trend, if you like, and, and this is giving way to other forms of consumption. Convenience base um, or customers who, are, uh, who don't need that big brand on their shirt to demonstrate a status, uh, you know, they're interested to understand more about the brand heritage and so on. So there are lots of changes and obviously China is a great example in terms of uh, mobility and we'll talk more about this in terms of the use of smart devices and, um, and the popularity of social media and how these two come together. So uh, more and more uh, the international involvement, you know, when we look at um, uh, you know, Tmall, Alibaba, we look at um, uh, Jingdong, you know, they started to venture out of China and uh, they started to target more and more foreign uh, opportunities. Um, the term O2O is specific to China and uh, O2O means online, offline, offline, online and um, most retailers that you talk to in China the vast majority of them, when you ask them what are your, you know, your plans, what's your vision, a lot of them talk about O2O. And what O2O is, uh, if you like, is a stepping stone towards moving towards multi-channel. How you move from a single channel to multiplicity in terms of channels. So we'll talk more about that. So this is a big change happening in China right now. Um, the Chinese um, e-commerce um, is, uh, is going, you know, very big and two years ago in Singles Day uh, it has bypassed um, the U.S. in terms of a single day of transactions. Even though maybe it's slightly artificial because obviously this is, this is more like Tmall rather than true e-commerce B2C across the country. But nevertheless, very significant and it's happening uh, in, in big waves. But if you look at the stats here, uh, between Tmall and Jingdong, that's the vast majority of the digital transactions in China. This is going to change, and this is beginning to change. When we first arrived in China five years ago, there was absolutely no interest uh, in terms of creating your own B2C, your own business to, to consumer. Because everyone thought, why do I need to create a new website? Um, I can just use Tmall and uh, Tmall has a lot of traffic uh, and uh, you know we're getting lots of revenue from that. But this is changing and you will start to see um, a lot more interest in establishing your own presence. Why is that, do you think? Why do you think brands and retailers are now not only banking on Tmall but also now interested to have their own channels? 
Alibaba's responding to this, and it, it recognizes that actually it, it would is gradually going to lose market share. It's still very successful, and would remain successful for many years to come. But they don't have that complete dominance, so they started to take steps. So one of the steps they started to, to take is they started to go overseas. So they signed treaty with the British government, treaty with other overseas government to make it easy for brands and retailers to, uh, to export to China. So they're trying to compensate for some of the losses in the Chinese market by um, going overseas. But they, they're doing other things as well. So if you look at what Alibaba is doing now, you know, Alibaba bought a stake in Tmall, uh, sorry, in, um, in Intime uh, department store um, two years ago. And recently they also bought a, a, a stake in, uh, in Suning. Why is Alibaba interested to buy stakes in retailers like uh, End Time, Department Store, and Sonic? Any idea? Apologies for my pronunciation if I'm not saying it correctly. You know, End Time or Yentai, Department Store? Yeah. They are in Beijing, there are various other. So <coughs> Alibaba bought 20% um, in them. Um, two years ago, and recently, last year, they bought a stake also in Suning. Why are they buying stakes in retailers? Yes? So, uh, I think it's because of collaboration. Uh, they, want to their, uh, they want to uh, increase their uh, ex uh, exposure in the, um, uh, uh, in the not only uh, re uh, online, but also um, the retail and the uh, 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 electronic uh, 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 department source. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, collaboration and expansion of business models and categories and so on, yes, of course, that's definitely a driver. But in addition to that, uh, one of the main drivers is it's actually, it's a different business model. Alibaba is not B2C. Alibaba is B2B2C. And by moving into Suning and uh, Nientai in time, they are learning B2C, you know, proper retail, proper B2C. Otherwise, they are just acting as, uh, you know, uh, they facilitate other businesses. Yes? Uh, actually, I have the uh, same uh, idea because uh, Alibaba actually is this is like the corporate strategy means the business model from the Alibaba is from the B2B and transform to B2C. So this is a why Alibaba yep. find the Sunni and to get more directly uh, engaged with the uh, you know, so in a way, they're actually learning about retail uh, from uh, from these companies because Alibaba is not really uh, a retailer as such. And this is this is the irony. This is the irony in terms of business today. You know, you have the largest uh, taxi organization in the world. Uber doesn't own a single taxi. Uh, you have, um, uh, you know, um, the, the the most successful digital, uh, you know, retailer is not a retailer. You know, Timo. And, and so on. So it's all about innovation in terms of how you maximize um, your, your offerings. And that doesn't mean having huge assets. It's knowing um, how to create that kind of brand and how to create the offerings. Uh, and what they're doing is they're not resting on, on the, uh, you know, the, 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 they, are, they are recognizing the market is moving away from them and that's why they're taking active steps. So what else is happening in terms of the um, Chinese uh, trends? Obviously, um, social is big globally, uh, but not as big as it is in China. In China, it's absolute massive in terms of uh, the dependency uh, on, on, on social. So 91% of the Chinese users have social network active compared to, say, 67 in the US. So um, you know, social media. Uh, is, is massive and, and when we talk about uh, retail as a continuous dialogue and you have very strong social media you can start to see why things are going to take off in China pretty quickly so there are lots of changes happening very quickly and it's really mainly because of this because of the way social media is being used WeChat is supposed to be the equivalent of WhatsApp but it's not it's, it's way more powerful uh, WeChat is not just WhatsApp, it's, not, it's WhatsApp and Facebook and LinkedIn and, and, and many others all in. 
So incredibly powerful mechanism. And if there is one threat to Alibaba's empire, it's Tencent and, and it's WeChat. Uh, and obviously, they, they try to, um, uh, you know, to compensate, but um, huge potential here in terms of bridging the gap between online and offline. Um, so, um, um, lots of uh, activities. Uh, in terms of payment, I'm, I'm incredibly impressed with the way transactions and payment are, are happening in China. In terms of Alipay and the use of mobile, far more powerful, far more versatile than, say, what we have in the West. The other thing happening is, um, you know, we went through an evolution in the West in terms of the use of desktops, in terms of the use of um, uh, B2C and browsers and so on. From a Chinese perspective, they are almost bypassing this and moving straight into mobile, straight into, uh, uh, you know, social media coupled with that. So, um, 69 of Chinese consumers, uh, they, they purchase through smart devices as compared to, say, 46 in the U.S. So, these are two very powerful points uh, in, within the Chinese market. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, there is more and more, if you like, subtlety in terms of what consumers are asking. So, they're not after the, you know, the big Gucci uh, uh, logo to demonstrate the wealth uh, or the, you know, the, 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 the Rolex watch and so on. They are more interested now to have something a bit more subtle and to understand more about the brand heritage and how that brand heritage maps to their own persona. So what kind of image you're trying to portray uh, and, and what does the brand stands for and, and how you relate to that brand. So this is happening more and more in China uh, rather than just simply buying because it's branded. Now there is more interest in terms of what that brand um, actually represents. So there is a lot more uh, awareness now in terms of brand values and heritage. <coughs> also, we started to see the emergence of what we call cash rich, time poor, people who are interested in convenience, people who buy, uh, you know, from the internet or digital, not because they're looking for a bargain, not because they are price sensitive, but because it's convenient, because it's easy for them to use. Um, and also, the government obviously is very important in terms of um, uh, lowering the barriers for IPO. Um, this has taken, a, you know, somewhat a bit of a hit in the last six to twelve months, uh, in, in, you know, in terms of the current market conditions. But in general, it has been um, a powerful trend. So that was just a, a brief introduction in terms of uh, what's happening in the world, both globally and in China. Uh, if there is no question on the trends, we move to the uh, to the next topic, which which we then start to talk about multi-channel. Any questions? Okay. And thank you for those who are contributing so far. So Sophie is taking note of all the people that are uh, uh, responding and, and answering questions. Uh, so I'm happy to to see that as we go through the lecture. Um, you are getting more and more engaged, so that's a good thing. Right, let's talk about multi-channel. Our industry is full of acronyms, and sometimes people maximize the use of acronyms just to confuse people and just make it sound, you know, they're doing something really exciting, really interesting. You know, they talk a language that no one else speaks, so you hear a lot of acronyms in the industry. So. Um, you know, uh, people talk about uh, multi-channel, multiple channels, cross channels, and now the latest term, omni-channel. So I just want to quickly talk about what does it mean, where did it come from, and, and, you know, and, and where is it heading. So initially, we we're just using a single channel, just one way of interacting, transacting with consumers. Typically, that was physical stores. Then we started to develop other ways to talk to customers, but they were disconnected. So that's when we talk about multiple channels. So I have a store and I have, for example, um, uh, a B2C, a website. The two aren't talking to each other. Then I started to move into multi-channel and I started to make these channels connected such that they share um, you know, information among themselves to make the customers feel that can use multiplicity of these channels. Then I move to cross-channel, which means within one shopping experience, I can cross multiple channels. 
Um, for example, as a consumer, I can use channel one to do my research. I can then um, buy from a second channel. I can have my merchandise delivered to me from a third channel. And if I'm unhappy with it, I can go to a fourth channel and return it. And then I go to a fifth channel and then share my story, share my experience. So this is cross-channel. I'm using five channels within one customer journey. And then the latest term is omni. Omni-channel. What does omni mean? Omni in Latin means all. So all channels appear as one. That's what omni-channel means. So when, we, when people talk about O2O in China, what they are really describing, what they are really saying is omni. How to move towards an omni world whereby it doesn't matter how you talk to us. It doesn't matter how you start to talk to us. What does matter is across all these channels, um, I have shared experience in terms of high quality service and also uh, the brand consistency. That's what is important. So the, the statement here is customers don't care about channels. They care about the brand and understanding you know, who they are talking to. And then the, the means to talk to this brand is less important. That's your problem to, work, to, to worry about in terms of how to provide that, that kind of experience. So to succeed in this new world, uh, we, there are conditions. And the conditions is channels need to appear as one. What does that mean? It means you need to have consistency. Consistency in the experience. What does a consistency in the rich experience mean? It means if I use the website and I have great experience, and then I use the mobile and I have you know, a really bad, rubbish experience, there's no consistency. One channel is more rich than the other. Um, and if I have great customer service in one channel, but bad one in another, that's not consistency. And then obviously quality and so on. So for this to happen, all channels need to share. But what do they share? What, what kind of information critical for these channels to share in terms of uh, success? Yes. I have a question. Go ahead. The difference between a multiple channel and multi-channel. Right. Multiple means they're kind of disconnected. You know. So you know, when, when, when we started this 20 years ago, 22 years ago, um, the first time a retailer put um, a digital channel, they didn't integrate it, they didn't talk, so you had multiple. Then multi was more about, uh, you know, it's really just to signify that people started with disconnected and then they moved more towards connected. Yeah. But the key thing, I mean, don't get overwhelmed by all of this. The key thing is, you know, we move from a single channel to omni-channel. That's the key thing in terms of transition. Okay, so I asked a question earlier, which is, to make this thing work, you need to share information across channels. And my question is, what kind of information do you think these channels need to share? Customer, Customer information, yes. Um, because imagine I go to one channel and then I give my details. I give my name, address, my, all my details. And then I start another channel and then they ask me, okay, who, who are you? you know, give your details again. So obviously, that's not great customer experience. Or if I start the journey in one channel and I place uh, items in my uh, shopping basket, and then I go to another channel, and then I can't see my uh, shopping cart. It disappears. So for example, I start an experience on the web, and I go to an e-commerce website, and I place a shirt in my basket. Then, uh, you know, in the car, I'm trying to uh, continue my journey and then access the mobile app and then I can't see the product I place in the basket. So you need to share customers, you need to share state, basket information, and, and so on. So that's what we mean um, in terms of omnichannel. But to be honest, whether you talk about multi-channel, cross-channel, omnichannel, the key thing is and that's why I prefer to use the term customer centricity because customer centricity encompasses all of that. So rather than focusing on the channels, we want to focus on the customers. And, and that's why uh, omnichannel actually means 
customer centricity. So these are all the channels that are available for you. And you know, the consumer can decide what channel to use. This is very important. You, as a retailer, cannot dictate to the customer what channel to use. The customers will decide what channel to use and when to use it. There is, um, there was an, there is an ad um, for martini, you know, the drink. It says anytime, any place, anywhere. And, and this was used as a theme for um, you know, some of the ventures in the UK in terms of multi-channel because we you know, were basically trying to say customers will decide what channel, so any product, any time, any channel, uh, you know, similar to the martini ad. So customers are in charge um, in terms of deciding where to, uh, how to start to talk to you, how to buy, uh, you know, and I'll give you more examples about this later on. So we talked about uh, the sharing, we talked about alignment. Why do you need to have alignment? One of the models for um, multi-channel is um, uh, uh, click and collect. Click and collect means you go to the browser, to the website, and you place an order on something, but then you go to the store and collect it. So click and collect. You are using an online channel and then a physical channel for your transaction. So what happens if people in the store are not aligned to the people in the, on, on the website? So you need to have consistency in terms of uh, process. Speaking of which, I want to ask another question. So if you give commission on sales, and to take the example of click and collect, a customer places an order online, but then collect it in the store, who should get commission? the web team or the store team. So can I see anyone who thinks it should be the web team? Put your hands up, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight people, nine. Nine people think it should be the web team that should get commission. Okay, now, how many think it should be the store team? Could you put your hands up, please? How many think the store should get the commission? One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, almost the same. Okay, how many think both teams, web team and, and store team should get commission? Hands up, please. Yeah, you win. If you don't give commission to both teams and you only give it to one team, it won't, it won't work. Both need to be incentivized, both need to be engaged, otherwise it just wouldn't work because you're trying to create um, a collaborative culture. Sometimes in China, based on you know, experience working here, that can be a little bit difficult sometimes. Sometimes we see too much silos, you know, departments are not talking to each other, are not collaborating enough with each other. And that's a challenge. This is not going to work in a multi-channel world. In the old days, you can get away with it. So you can have, you know, marketing, separate from merchandise, separate from supply chain, customer service and so on. That might work in the past. Today, it won't work. You need to be far more collaborative and far more horizontal than vertical. So marketing need to understand life from a merchandise perspective, supply chain, customer service, and so on. All these departments need to engage and work with each other. Hence, we talk about PPT. Not PowerPoint, but PPT. People, process, technology. You need to have alignment on these things in terms of people, process, and technology. Um, it's not just about technology. And that's one of the challenges in China. There is a lot of thinking about, if I buy uh, you know, a, a technology from a big IT supplier like Oracle or I, IBM or, or any of these big uh, brands, then everything's going to be okay. And, and that is not true. Um, you take a company like Suning, Suning spent huge amount of money in buying technology which didn't work. Not, not because there is any problem with the technology itself, but because of this, PPT. They didn't take enough initiative to understand how this technology is going to work within the organization. Technology should fit within your business, not your business fit within technology. So that's, that's key. And for you to understand how technology fits within your business, you need to understand your business. And if I look at, for example, you know, uh, the HR department in China, 
this is a department that um, doesn't have enough teeth, doesn't have enough power. Because HR seems to be a place you go to when you want to uh, hire someone and you know you don't have um, a you know, strong foundation from an HR perspective to understand the impact of change when you introduce change. So these are some of the challenges. Um, when multi-channel started to emerge, uh, it used to be a CMO, a Chief Marketing Officer responsibility because it was seen as a marketing initiative. Gradually that shifted from a CMO to a CIO, a Chief Information Officer, as it shifted from marketing to innovation. Today, it is CEO's responsibility. It's the Chief Executive responsible for this. Otherwise, it won't work. Change must be driven from the top and cascade down. In your previous slide, you mentioned about something that you need to be aligning all channels, and you mentioned PPT. But I think probably uh, process or technology should not be something that be aligned to all channels, especially nowadays you have online and offline channels. And the technology for the two channels are t completely different. And the process should be different, because offline is more traditional online, probably, you know, uh, a lot of new technologies, a lot of new techniques, uh, marketing techniques, uh, so they shouldn't be aligned. Uh, so I guess probably that need to be aligned should be information uh, that is needs to be aligned. That's the most important thing. And of course, system. So basically, the aligned system assure you get uh, share all the information. Mm -hmm. Just a, a sense of sense. Sure. Alignment doesn't mean the same. So when I talk about alignment of process, for example, between online and offline, that doesn't mean I'm saying the process is identical between online and offline. Alignment means we understand the same goal and we can go about process in different ways, but these processes complement each other. They don't work. Uh, focus and what a merchandiser does in an offline focus there is a difference Be because if you for example visual merchandising in the store is about you have a um, finite store and you're trying to organize your products in such a way to create a maximum effect from a branding perspective but online um, you know the same role merchandiser is not confined with that space because you have an infinite space. So you can basically have different ways of, of providing merchandising, not limited from a space perspective. So the, the role itself could sound similar, merchandising online, merchandising offline. They take different implementation, but they need to be aligned in terms of what are the key products we need to highlight, what is the range we want to highlight, and what's the process and so on. So that's what alignment means. It doesn't mean replica, it means collaborative. A new role to make the alignment and collaboration? Massive. The question is if the responsibility of multi channel is going to be in the hands of CEO, is, it, is there going to be an organization change? And the answer is yes, in a massive way, in a big way. Completely. And that's the key. That's why it's CEO. That's why marketing cannot do this on their own, or, uh, or innovation cannot do this on their own. That's why it needs to come from, uh, from the CEO. So uh, the question is, is, is a good one because um, the only person in the organization that is capable of driving that transformation is the CEO. No one else can do that. What kind of change? So the question is, what type of changes 
can occur? You know, will we have new roles? Um, and the answer is, there will be a change across all aspects. So new roles will be created. Some roles might disappear. Some roles might be joined. So there will be a lot of changes. For example, if you look at data, if you look at information, and if you ask a question today in a traditional organization, who's responsible for data? Take products. Take product information. How you describe the products that you are uh, selling. Who's responsible for that today? And the answer is, there is no one responsible. No one has that kind of responsibility for the product. And the reason for that is, in the traditional way of um, retailing, um, you don't need much information about products. You know, you walk into a store and you pick, you know, um, a suit and you try the suit, you feel the suit, you look at the suit. You don't need a lot of information to describe that suit. But when you buy it online, when you buy it on a digital channel, you need to have a lot of information about the fabric, about the design, about the cut, about the size, you know, and, and, and many more. Same goes with food. People don't buy when they buy food. It's not just the base information they're interested in. They want to know information about uh, the diet and the health and the allergy and, um, uh, you know, lifestyle, legal, all sorts of things. So the uh, information has exploded from very tiny, uh, limited set of attributes to a huge amount. So whose responsibility is that? That's just one example in terms of the changes in today's world from an organization point of view. Um, so, and there are many more. And um, the last part of this course talks in detail about the type of changes and how you go about the change. Any other question? Okay, so in this picture, we are showing just in one picture what an omnichannel vision is all about. Um, and uh, the foundations, we see all the different channels. So we see the store, we see the web, we see social, mobile, catalogs, kiosks, and so on. All of these channels um, have richness in terms of offering and you know, they show consistency in terms of um, services. And then on top of that, we see three things. We see alignment across people, process, and technology. Um, I'll be introducing a framework for transformation called AACCI, which stands for Alignment, Agility, Customer Centricity, Collaboration, and, and Innovation. And if, there is, if you ask me, in 22 years in the industry, what is the key reason of failure, it is alignment. If you don't have alignment, then it basically fails. So um, that's uh, an incredibly um, big barrier. And especially in China, um, I'll give you many examples when we talk about that in terms of how the lack of alignment can cause uh, big failure. So alignment is one aspect. The other aspect is we already talked about, which is uh, sharing. And sharing uh, is um, customer information, customer data, customer details, as we mentioned, but also sharing in terms of uh, some commercial aspects. That can be harder, because if you look at, um, for example, uh, franchising, franchise business. If you have franchising as a business model, and you are using a number of partners through which their channels you are selling your, your products, then if you don't have control in that, on that relationship in terms of what range they sell, what price you know, they have and so on, then that could be challenging. So obviously there are certain things that can be achieved easily and then there are other things are much harder uh, in terms of having that kind of commercial um, uh, agreement if you like. But, so this is this is an area which is um, quite key, quite important in terms of having the, if you like, criteria for success in omnichannel. Um, and then the third one is um, agility. Agility means ability to react quickly. There are changes happening all the time and um, we need to be able to take note of how these changes are impacting us and then um, take steps to change. So, for example, if um, you are focused on tactical measures in terms of achieving your goals, achieving your objectives, 
then this could be okay from a time to market perspective. So for example, um, if you want to launch a new channel and your focus is launching that channel because you want to be the first, maybe, in your category, if that is your business driver, then that's fine. But in the future, if you want to use that channel to be able to move easily into other areas, then time to market is not the only driver. Do, do you see what I mean? So you need to be clear why you're doing certain projects. You need to have very uh, clear success criteria, whether the objective is time to market or whether the objective is extensibility in the future. The two are very different. So one can be more tactical than the others. So this is quite an um, uh, important aspect. This slide, as I, as I was saying, is, is quite a key slide and um, it's a very visionary slide. Um, what the slide is trying to say is this. If you want to expand your business, you have five ways of doing it. You can expand based on categories, i.e. based on what is it that you're selling today. Um, so you could be selling food and then moving into other areas, so that's categories. You can focus on channels, um, you know, from web to um, store to mobile, uh, social media and so on. Uh, you can expand based on business models. So B2C, B2B2C, marketplace, affiliates, uh, flash, white label, etc. You can um, go about it in a regional way um, in terms of um, expanding internationally across various regions or you can expand in terms of segments. So taking your current segment and then figuring out how do you expand on these things. These are the five ways available for you to succeed. Um, and what's critical is when we started to talk, to talk about multi-channel 22 years ago, um, people were focused only on this aspect, how you grow your business based on channels. The more experience you have, the more confident you have, then you started to think about other ways, business models. If you, if you look at Amazon, for example, Amazon started as what? As selling books online. But Amazon introduced a number of business models. Amazon have expanded into multiple categories. You know, people who shop at Amazon today don't shop for books only. They buy um, just about anything you can imagine, all from Amazon. So the ability to expand on categories from books only to multiple categories is an example of what Amazon have achieved in the last 22 years. Um, but also in terms of channels, so the focus was only in terms of B2C and, uh, uh, and web. Now you started to see physical stores associated with Amazon and lockers, uh, an ability to uh, click and collect. Uh, so you started to see expansion from pure online to other channels. And also you started to see diversification in terms of business models. So Amazon started as B2C, but then they started to expand into other areas. So those of you who shop at Amazon and when you, when you search for a certain product, you come, the results come back to say this is the product stock uh, you know, indicator and the price, but also you can buy it from other merchants. And if you click on the link, you will see many merchants and each merchant will have a price and will have reviews, etc. So this is called marketplace. It's within your brand and you are giving space to multiple merchants to sell through your own brand. But also they use something called shared platform. So through the Amazon uh, technology, number of retailers were selling their products, like uh, Marks and Spencer, which um, is an English department store in China. In the past, when they started online, they were selling through Amazon. If you go to the website, it looks like Marks and Spencer, but actually behind the scenes, it was driven by Amazon. That's an example of shared platform. Mothercare is the same. Mothercare started also, you know, powered by Amazon. So, as you can see, they've expanded from B2C into multiple other business models. And of course, they started in the US and then they expanded internationally. And when you look at segment, um, you can't say this segment only buys from Amazon. You know, in, within Amazon, you have a whole variety of segments. 
uh, based on age, based on, based on demographic, based on price, point, etc. So the point about this slide is, is to keep an open mind about multiplicity and not only to think about multi-channel but think far bigger than multi-channel and think about all of these aspects in terms of having the uh, courage, if you like, to expand from categories to business models to regions to segments and so on. So in other words, we are living in a world which is beyond just multi-channel and multiplicity is applied to a whole variety of things. Any question on this? That's quite a key slide in terms of where the market is moving towards in the future. There aren't many people who talk about this today, but gradually more and more people will be interested in this vision. Yes? So what do you mean by the white label? Right. White label um, almost means... Um, so, for example, if I want to sell um, water under my brand, I will get um, unbranded uh, bottles from, from someone who will actually go through the manufacturer, almost like an OEM and then I stick my label on it and then sell it as my own label. So that's what white label means. Ability to, to transact through multiple suppliers and then we put our own brand. I'll give examples on, on that later on in terms of what we've done um, in 1999 on white label for Tesco. Well, Tesco means you can find a lot of suppliers but you can your own label. Yes. So it means you have, um, you know, suppliers but then you put your own label which actually brings me to a point here <clears throat> there are a number of critical success factors to make this thing work one of them is alliances and partnership so alliances is key for success um, and this comes across in a number of ways so one of the keywords that I will be talking a lot about during the course of today and tomorrow is uh, alliances and partnership and that's one of the changes that needs to happen in the organization that today uh, companies don't think about alliances uh, you know important enough and that needs to change because there is no such thing as an island you know everything is connected and, and you have to connect to a whole variety of network of alliances in order to succeed <coughs>